If you have your Bibles this morning, I invite your attention to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, hopefully familiar verses to most everyone here this morning. As we will read verses 6 and 7 and 8. Romans chapter number 5. In verse number 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. There we go. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray that you will bless the message this morning. Hide the preacher behind the cross. Use the message to stir our hearts, to be able to give our lives for you, as you have given your life for us. And that, Father, we pray that you would just work your willed way in all that we do. Our Father, we ask and we pray this now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Tomorrow is Memorial Day. Memorial Day, some thinking being established so that the government can have a three-day holiday. For others, the unofficial start of summer. I see many times that people are thanking our veterans for their service at Memorial Day. Not, it's good to do, but it's not exactly the same thing. Because Memorial Day is about sacrifice. That's what Memorial Day is about. Memorial Day is about honoring those men and women who have served in our military, who have given the ultimate sacrifice of service, their lives. It's about the flags that are set up in the cemetery in front of those that have given their life for service for their country. In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, and verse 13, Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's what many of these have done that have given the ultimate sacrifice. They laid down their life for their friends, their comrades in arms, to help keep them safe. These men and women laid down their lives also for people they didn't even know. Here in the home front. They laid down their lives for you and me. They laid down their lives so that we could be here this morning. To worship God freely of a clear conscience. According to the dictates of our conscience. That's in the First Amendment of the United States. They gave the ultimate sacrifice so that we could say stupid things. They gave their lives so that we could live our lives in peace. Here. That's what tomorrow is about. That's what Memorial Day is about. It's about sacrifice. And the ultimate sacrifice that was given by those who gave their lives in service of our country. 
Have you ever sacrificed? There's an interesting question. Most of us in here would say, yes, I've made a sacrifice of one form or another. I sacrificed my time. I may have sacrificed my money. I may have sacrificed some of my possessions. Parents have sacrificed for their children. Grandparents have sacrificed for their grandchildren. Time and memorial, that has gone on. But what is the ultimate sacrifice? See, there's a sacrifice that's greater than a person laying down their lives for their friends or laying down their lives for their country. There is the ultimate sacrifice made by one over 2,000 years ago at a place called Calvary. Where one person, one man, who was also God in the flesh, laid down his life willingly that we might have life through him. Now let me look to answer two questions right away. When did Christ do this? And why did Christ do this? And I think we can answer those two in the same way. With basically the same points. We notice as we read in verse number 6, when we were yet without strength when did christ die for us when we were without strength when we could not save ourselves when we could not reconcile ourselves to god and there's not a person here who can Reconcile themselves to God. You may hear people say, well, I'm a good person. Well, I'm glad. But when it comes to taking care of the problem of your sin and reconciling your sin unto God, you can't do it. I don't care how good you are. Because the Bible says in Isaiah that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. It doesn't matter how good you are. You can't reconcile yourselves to God. You haven't got the strength. When we were without strength, when we were spiritually weak, when we were, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, dead in trespasses and in sins. Not only were we spiritually weak, we were spiritually dead before we came to know Christ as our Savior. Dead in our trespasses, dead in our sins, living for the lust of our flesh, living for self. Christ came when we were without strength. Christ also came when we were ungodly. We see that there also in verse number 6, at the, in the last phrase of verse number 6. When we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the irreverent, the impious, or the wicked. That describes us. At least me. Robin, I don't know. The debate is still out. Again, as we go back to that passage there in Ephesians chapter (coughs) 2. 
<coughs> there in verse number one. Ephesians 2 and verse 1, the Bible tells us there, And you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sins, wherein in time past, Ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, our manner of life in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as Others. I don't know about you, but I think that describes someone who is ungodly. And if you're here knowing Christ as your personal Savior, before you gave your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ, this was you. You may be here this morning having, never, have, having not ever given your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. This describes you. dead in trespasses and in sins, following the world, following Satan, trying to be able to fulfill the desires of the lust of your heart. Sinners are selfish. It's all about them. Not willing to sacrifice. And the Bible says that when we were without strength and we were ungodly, Christ died for us. Christ also died for us when we were sinners. It says there in verse number 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. A sinner is someone who is sinful. But in the society that we live in today where, you know, right is wrong and wrong is right and anything goes, it's like the Wild West. Many people don't understand the concept of sin. They don't know what it is. There may be some who even name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that don't understand the concept of sin. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4, the Bible tells us and defines for us what sin is. 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4. The Bible says in 1 John 3 and verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. That word transgression there in that verse means violation. The violation of God's law. That is sin. And the Bible says, we've all done it. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that seek after God. Isn't it great that God seeks after us? When we don't seek after him. The Bible says in Romans 3 and verse 23, for all have sinned. All of us have violated the law of God. All of us have put something before God in our life at one time or another. All of us have taken the Lord's name in vain at one time or another. And you didn't have to curse to do it. You know, my dad used to say that God's last name is excuse, God's last name is not excuse me, damn, which is true.
We've all disobeyed our parents. Anybody? Anybody who was a perfect child in the house? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. <laughs> Sister Roberta was a perfect child and never disobeyed her parents. Sister Roberta and I will have a conversation after church. She's going to tell me how she did that. Because I didn't. I know. All of us have stole. Every person in here has stole at one time or another. You don't have to steal from a store in order to steal. What a man robbed God, Malachi says. But ye have robbed me of tithes and offerings. There are times when we did that. There are times where we robbed our employer of time. We goofed off more than we worked. I know for some of you that's hard to do, but. <laughs> We've all coveted something at one time or another in our life. Oh, I like my neighbor's house. Man, it's a good looking house. Two ga three car garage, workshop in the back. Man, what a place. Wish I had that place. And my neighbor's car, oh, 1953 Corvette, mm. Mm. my midlife crisis is coming on. Every one of us has violated the commands of God. And the Bible says in James chapter 2 and verse 10, you only have to violate one to be a violator of God's law. You only have to violate one. I only have to get caught speeding once on 8th Street and have the policeman pull me over and give me that wonderful citation to be a lawbreaker in the city of Neodisha. Just once. We've all been sinful. We've all been without strength, spiritually weak, sinful by nature, wicked and irreverent and impious toward God. All of us have done that. And when we were in that condition, the Bible says Christ died for us. When we were enemies of God, when we wanted nothing to do with God, when we were away from God, Christ died for us. What a sacrifice. And why did Christ die for us? Because we were without strength. Because we were ungodly. God wanted to have a relationship with us. His people, his creation, God wants to have a relationship with you. He stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will let me in, I will sup with him and he with me. Think about that door. It's a very unusual door. It doesn't have a doorknob on the outside where Christ is knocking. Only you can let Christ in from the inside. He wants to have a relationship with you. And he gave the ultimate sacrifice to be able to do that. It's one other reason why Christ died for us. To show how much God loves us. But God commendeth his love toward us. The word commendeth, it basically means to show or to introduce or to demonstrate.
The verse we're all familiar with that Jesus told Nicodemus in the Gospel of John chapter 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world, the people of the world, humanity, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's see if I can find it. I think it's in here somewhere. First John chapter 4. In verse 10, the Bible says, Herein is love. First John chapter 4 and verse 10. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the covering for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, ought we not also to love one another? God loved us so much. That he gave us his son. His love led him to action. The action was to send his only begotten son. To pay the penalty for our violation of his law. That we might be made alive again through the spirit of God. To be born again. That we may have eternal life. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. That is a great sacrifice. But what about our willingness to sacrifice? For verse 7 says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. That word righteous man means an innocent man, one unjustly condemned. And that does happen in our justice system every once in a while. Innocent people go to prison. In an imperfect justice system, those things happen. But that does remind me of Christ, who was an innocent man unjustly accused, who willingly took our punishment for us. And I tell you, we weren't righteous. <laughs> Far from it, as I've described. But let me ask you this. If someone you knew and loved so much were wrongfully accused of a crime and were innocent, They were found guilty and were sentenced to punishment. Would you take their punishment for them? It's an interesting question. If my wife were long, wrongly accused of a crime and she was convicted of that crime and had to take that punishment, would I step up and say, hey, don't take her, take me? Let me pay her penalty for her. Would you do that? To be honest, most people wouldn't. How about for a good man? That word good man there in verse number seven, it means a useful man. One that is useful to a cause. The apostle Paul could be described as such a man. He was a useful man. A useful man in the 
spreading of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the world in his day, establishing churches, a useful man. And in Romans chapter 16 and verse number 4, <coughs> as Paul speaks and, and lists these fellow laborers of his, in verse number 3 he talks about Priscilla and Aquila, who traveled a lot with the Apostle Paul through his missionary journeys and earthly ministry. And he describes there in verse number four, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Would you give your life For a useful person? Per adventure? Possibly? Maybe? Would you do that? Family member, spouse, son or daughter, grandson or granddaughter, would you do that? Again, some might think about it. Very few, if any, would do it. But because God loved us so much, he sent his only begotten son. And we weren't righteous people, and we weren't good people. But God loved us so much, and he loves you so much even this morning, that he gave his life for you. The ultimate sacrifice. So maybe you're here this morning. You've never given your heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're still dead in trespasses and in sins. You can change that this morning. And we can take the Bible and show you how. You can take the first step in starting a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Guaranteeing yourself eternal life. Guaranteeing yourself a home in heaven guaranteeing yourself an inheritance laid up in heaven for you. But what does this speak to the believer, to those of us who know Christ as our personal Savior? We live in a shallow society today. We really do. People are self-absorbed with this. The computer you can carry in your hand. Video games, YouTube, Facebook. Self-absorbed. We live in a narcissistic society. Where all people generally care about is themselves. And they're not willing to give or to sacrifice themselves, their time, their talent, anything for anyone. And unfortunately, this has crept into the church in America.
As believers in Christ, I believe we need to be a people who are willing to sacrifice ourselves, to give our bodies, to give ourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. That when we see someone in need, we will help to meet that need as much as we can. Had a call, to, had a call this week from someone that was looking for help. They need the help. They asked our church if we could help. And you know what I told her after I went to go visit with her on Saturday and see the situation that she was asking for? I'll see what I can do. And I plan to do something, and I hope someone will come join me. To sacrifice some time, to get a little sweaty, to be able to help someone that can't do for themselves. Who knows? Maybe there's an opportunity to witness. An opportunity to lead a soul to Christ. God opens doors that way. We just have to be willing to sacrifice to walk through them. What are we willing to give of ourselves? I'm not talking about our money, and I'm not talking about our time necessarily. Of us, what are we willing to give of ourselves? When the Apostle Paul held up the churches of Macedonia in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, he talked about not their willingness to give an offering to help those that were in need in Jerusalem. But he says, first they were willing to give of themselves. We need to be willing to give of ourself, not be so self-absorbed. Knowing that there are others out there that need our help, and we're the only ones who can help them. And make a sacrifice that will be worthwhile if you're willing to make it. As we stand together for our invitation, I appreciate your time and attention this morning.